Let's turn to Hebrews chapter 3. Hebrews chapter 3. And uh, this is lesson number 5 in our study regarding Bible science and creation. Can you hear me back there? Uh, we, they need a little bit of volume back there. Hebrews chapter 3. This is the passage that we are uh, sort of building uh, around, I guess. Hebrews chapter 3, verse 3. Uh, For this man was counted worthy of more glory than Moses, inasmuch as he who hath builded the house hath more honor than the house. Verse 4, for every house is builded by some man, but he that built all things is God. He is the creator. And when he built all things, it wasn't some haphazard, random, arbitrary work of God. He didn't wake up one morning, snap his fingers because he was bored and decide I'm going to create a universe. The universe has been created with clear design, clear purpose, all part of the expression of his creative genius. And so when we talk about science, there are two ways to approach science. We are going to take the Bible route and understand science can only be studied and appreciated with that premise that there is a God. Of course, the other route is trying to study science and then coming to the conclusion, is there or is there not a God? Uh, You're going to get into serious trouble. Now, don't get me wrong. The fingerprints of God are all over the universe. We do recognize that things uh, are created with, with design and science Uh, Even though they may reject the concept of God, they do acknowledge that there is design and they try to talk, you know, they try to uh, talk people out of that appearance of design. If you recall, there was one well-known biologist who says that scientists have to continually remind themselves that what they're studying is not the consequence of design. It just appears to be design. Why do you have to every day? Yeah, that's right. It's not designed. It's not designed. It's not. It, it's sort of called brainwashing, if you will. So, with all of that, we've said enough things by uh, in regards to all of that. What I'd like to do this morning is go back to Genesis chapter one. Genesis chapter one, and um, we ended last lesson. The last lesson, talking about a principle uh, in creation called, I guess, the replication. Principle, not not that I want to coin, you know, all sorts of crazy theological terms or anything like that. But what we do see in God's word is that when God created the physical material universe, the universe that man can study, the natural sciences, for example, the physical material universe, the natural universe is a counterpart of some things that God already created. There is going to be in Scripture a correlation between the invisible and the visible. By the way, I actually go to Genesis 1. It's, it's okay. It's an easy place to go back to, right? Go, go to Romans chapter 1 very quickly because this replication principle uh, is, is found in a few passages. For example, it's interesting here in Romans chapter 1. We understand that the book of Romans establishes man's need. Man is in desperate trouble. Each and every one of us have been condemned because of sin. All of us are born in sin. And what Romans does is it it demonstrates that man is worthy of the justice of Almighty God being executed against the sinner. And what Romans is doing, especially in chapter 1, is is arguing that God has every right to destroy sinful humanity. And so Romans uh, chapter 1 begins to lay out the legal arguments as to why humanity is worthy of eternal destruction. And in light of that, it begins with what? Creation. It begins with man's response to the natural world. It's kind of interesting that that is one of the first. uh, It's sort of like a courtroom scene, right? And you have the prosecution and you have the defense. And uh, you have the prosecution that calls to the witness stand 
various witnesses that provide testimony. And so the first witness to provide testimony has to do with who God is as a creator. Now, uh, you know, we'll just jump right in, but look at verse 19 of Romans chapter 1. Well, let, let, read verse 18, because again, this is what the passage is establishing. Verse 18, for the wrath of God is revealed from where? Aren't you so glad God is not revealing his wrath on earth today? Because if God were to reveal his consuming wrath on earth today, we're in big trouble. God is in rejected exile. God is unwanted. And God is a gentleman. I mean, if, if I enter your home, by the way, it's his home. Can you believe this? God creates a house. God wants to dwell in the house. He invites a guest, Adam, to dwell with him in his house. And what ultimately happens? God, the creator, the owner, he's the one who's booted out. It's like the landlord is evicted. And so God, he's now going to argue the worthiness of each and every one of us to experience his wrath. And, and you know why? We don't witness the wrath of Almighty God today. And don't, get, and don't think God is a paper tiger. Romans 9 says that God is willing to show His consuming power. Well, what holds back the, uh, the, the display of God's wrath? It's called grace. It's called love. It's called mercy. Where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. And God is manifesting to all humanity that there is a characteristic that is intrinsically part of who he is, one of grace, mercy, and love. And instead of pouring out the fury against lost humanity, he sends his son, his only son, the Lord Jesus Christ, to the planet not to be a teacher, not to tell you how to be religious, not to be a church member, not to try to get straight and get with God. Jesus came into the world to save sinners. How did he do that? Jesus was made sin for us. Romans is going to go on and say that Jesus Christ was God's propitiation it was the father who was rejected by humanity. He's evicted from his own creation by the creature called Adam, called man. And God takes his son and nails him to the cross, offers him up as a sacrifice. He dies the death of the wicked. He dies the death of, of, of the sinner being made a curse for us, being made sin for us. And it's God with that pent-up fury and wrath who pours it all out in concentrated form against the Lord Jesus Christ who hangs there as the innocent one. And Christ died for our sins. He rose again the third day to prove that he conquered death, to prove that he paid the penalty of our sin. He proved that every sin that you and I ever committed, continue to commit and will commit, have been paid for in full. And the justice of God is satisfied. See, grace doesn't mean God overlooks sin. Grace means I'll deal with it personally. Mercy doesn't mean I'm just going to let you off the hook. Mercy means that God, he intervened on the stage of human history and he did something for us when we could never do it on our own. Because God is love. But love isn't cheap love. It isn't superficial love. It isn't love that's built upon emotions and sentiment and feel good. Love is a willingness to sacrificially, selflessly do something for someone else. And that's what God did. Jesus Christ died for all of our sins. And the only thing that God Almighty can ever accept. Is our faith. Because faith isn't a work. Faith simply means. Thank you Almighty God. For your grace, mercy and goodness. I don't deserve it. I couldn't earn it. I'm not good enough. And the Lord understands that. Jesus paid it all. And all to him I owe. You can have eternal life right now. I don't want you to be a member of Shorewood. 
I don't want you to be a member of any church. I don't want you to be religious. I don't want you to be. I just ask you to let the Lord Jesus Christ be your savior. All you do is in the heart of hearts. Say, I believe that. And you take it by faith. And in that moment, you have eternal life. Now, I say all of that because the first witness to the stand is going to argue man's treatment of the creator. So verse 19, uh, 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 verse 18, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and right, unrighteousness of the men. Hey, does that include you and me? There is none righteous. No, not one. There is none that doeth good. No, not one. We've all gone out of the way. We're all unprofitable. And that's good news. Because God isn't out there trying to save good people. Heaven is not a reward for being good. Because there's none that doeth good. Heaven is a gift to those who aren't good. So we qualify. We come to him as we are in absolute desperate need. I can't do it, God, and God understands that. That's why he's done all the work. So it's revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness. The men who hold, that is, they suppress, they, they keep it down. The truth and unrighteousness. Well, okay, Mr. Witness, standing there in the witness stand. Why am I worthy of the wrath of God? This is why, Alex, you're worthy of it. Verse 19, because that which may be known of God is manifest where? Listen, you Ask a three-year-old, you know, preschool just started this week. And Sherry, you know, she's bouncing off the walls. She's got, you know, 70 kids. I mean, she doesn't teach 70 kids. The whole preschool has 70 kids. And, you know, you ask a three-year-old, who made all of this? I bet you nine out of ten times, you know what they say? God. It's man. There is something in man's conscience that bears testimony. Wait a minute. I'm not an accident. I'm not, the, I'm not the result of some random act of chaotic activity from the slime. There is something in man that bears testimony. So what does man do over the course of time? Just like that biologist, you got to remember, there is no God. There is no God. There is no God. And if you say it loud enough, and if you say it long enough, what begins to happen? I don't think there is a God. Why? Because I was trained all my life to provide a substitute, to provide another explanation for my existence. So, um, uh, verse 19, because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has showed it unto them. Now, look at verse 20. Here is this replication principle. Verse 20, for the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen. You know what Psalms 19 says? Listen, the, 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 the heavens, they declare the handiwork got speech, utter a speech. You study creation and it screams loudly. There is a creator. There is a designer. There's no rational explanation for the uh, uh, events and, and, and the movements and the activities in the universe. It's clearly seen. And we went through some verses last Sunday morning where God, he keeps saying, I'm not, I'm not trying to keep this a secret. God's desire is he wants to be known. He wants to be identified. He wants to be observed. He wants to be studied. He wants to be loved and appreciated and valued for who he is. There is a creator. He isn't trying to hide. He's not trying to keep it secret. It's man, because of the nature of sin, that takes the weight of evidence and, and manipulates it and provides false arguments, and so on and so on. Verse 20, for the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, now notice, being understood by the things that are made. Wait a minute. The invisible things of him are clearly seen. How? Being understood by the things that are what? Now, we understand that in this verse, it's talking about uh, even his eternal power and Godhead so that they are without excuse. The creation bears testimony that there is a Godhead. There is God comprised of three entities, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, that, that uh, it bears testimony that things are created. But also note, the invisible are understood by the what? The visible. So let's reverse the order. If we study the visible, 
what does that teach us? There's something, there's a correlation between the visible with the invisible. You see the replication principle? Listen, God didn't do, God says, listen, you want to understand something about what you can't see? Well, I've made a replica by the things which you can see. Genesis 1, don't go there. What did God say when he created Adam? He created Adam in his own image. In the likeness of God created he. So what does, so when Adam isn't some weird, we're not some weird, bizarre type of life. God says, I have imprinted the likeness. You see, we know how God looks like. If God says, I'm creating Adam in my image, in my likeness, that tells us something. Uh, go to Colossians chapter 1. Again, this, this idea of, of replication, Colossians chapter 1. And uh, here in Colossians 1, verse 16, Colossians 1, 16. For by him were all things created. And, and again, he's a builder, he's a technician, he's, he's an ergonomic uh, engineer. Everything's been engineered following that plan. You've got to have a plan, you've got to have uh, parts, you've got to have tools, you've got to have a time schedule, and that's how God describes his handiwork. For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and what? But notice, so, so okay, you have heaven, and then you have earth. What verse does that come to mind? In the beginning, God created the? So, what do we know about heaven and earth? There are things that are visible. What would that correlate with? The earth. And then there are things that are what? Invisible. What would that correlate with? The heavens. And yet, now we read, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. In the context, it's specifically talking about the various power structures and so forth. But isn't it interesting? God is saying, look, there's the visible, invisible and there's the visible. And you know what? The Lord is talking about principalities, powers, thrones, dominions, and might. So, there's an application with and through the, the principalities power, that apply to what? Both realms. So we don't have to wonder what's going on in heaven. All we have to do is understand, well, what do we visibly witness? And we know all about government, whether it's the president to the governor to the mayor to the alderman to the councilman. Isn't that interesting? To the ward boss <laughs> or the ward captain? Well, that's the idea. We, we can look at the business affairs of humanity and the governmental machinery of humanity, and we see the power structures and God is saying, you see that? Guess what's going on in the invisible realm? Same thing. One more verse, Hebrews chapter 8. Hebrews chapter 8. Again, the, the replication. There's a parallel. There's a counterpart. Uh, Hebrews chapter 8. And notice there in verse 1. Uh, Hebrews chapter 8, verse 1. Now, of the things which we have spoken, this is the sum. We have such an high priest who was set on the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens, a minister of the sanctuary. Now, where's the concept of the sanctuary first taught in Scripture? Book of Exodus. And of the true tabernacle, which the Lord pitched and not met. Wait a minute. We study the book of Exodus. All of a sudden, we're introduced with a sanctuary. And then wasn't the drawings, the architectural plan given to Moses to build a tabernacle? But this verse is talking about a what? A true tabernacle. The replication principle. There is a tabernacle, by the way, is a temporary dwelling place. In fact, look at the end of verse 2. And of the true tabernacle, which the Lord, you see that word pitched? You ever pitch a tent? You know that when the Lord talks about the true tabernacle, he uses terminology that signifies the temporary nature of the structure. You know that the tabernacle in heaven is not intended to be permanent? What? No. That's why he created earth. 
There is a tabernacle, a temporary dwelling place that God pitched. Have you ever gone? I, we used, I used to love camping. My daughter hated it. And so we, we went to Yellowstone. And you know how we, we, we didn't go to the lodge in Yellowstone. We, I had two monster tents. Kids were in one. Sherry and I were in the other one. And, uh, you know, you got to spend a little bit of time pitching the tent, right? But I didn't have mail sent to Yellowstone. I didn't receive electric bills or gas bills or mortgage payments or fines. Uh, you, you, why? I, I temporarily pitched a tent at Yellowstone because we were only there for, what, five days. God uses the land. Pit, God says, I'm pitching it in the heavens because one day his intention was to permanently found it, to permanently establish it. That's why the Bible, when it talks about the creation of the earth, God says, I've set some beams down there. there there's a permanent structure, a permanent foundation. God's intention was for this true tabernacle no longer to be pit. The, 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 the stakes are there now, but he's going to pull those stakes. And guess where this tabernacle is going to come? Uh, that's, remember when we were in the book of Revelation? It's called New Jerusalem. And, and the whole intention is, God's intent was for the earth to be the center of all his religious, righteous, political rule in the universe. So the word pitch, very interesting. But, but, but you see the replication here? Wait a minute. I know in Exodus there is that tabernacle that God told Moses to build. But this isn't talking about that one. It's talking about the invisible one. Drop down to verse 5. Verse 5, who serve unto the example and shadow of what? You see the replication principle? You understand that everything that Moses built regarding the tabernacle is a shadow and an example of what? Heavenly things. As Moses was admonished of God when he was about to make the tabernacle for, see, saith he, that thou make all things according to the pattern shown to thee in the mount. God took what exists in the third heaven, the true tabernacle, and he drew up an architectural plan. Uh, and, and, you know, we have an architect here. Uh, I was in engineering for a while, and we know all about drawings. And, and you know what you have in the drawing? You have specifications, and you have, you know, the types of material that you're supposed to be, tolerance level. Wow. You know, you talk about tolerances. You know, within plus or minus point zero 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 zero. <laughs> and how do, you, how do you meet those tolerances? When God gave Moses, here is the plan. It's the pattern, but it's a shadow of what does exist in the heavens. So if you want to know, well, I wonder how that tabernacle looks like in the heavens. What do you do? You study Exodus. And bingo. It's a replication. It's as though this is all a scale model, if you will. All right. With all of that, let's go now to Genesis. And what I wanted to do is just lay out what God is doing. All right. Now, in Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. Okay. Genesis 1, 1. We, of course, read here, uh, verse 1 and 2. I, I want to focus on verse 2. Verse 1, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Now, look at verse 2. And the earth was without form and void. So, as I said last time, from this point on, all the way down to verse 19, you have God putting form and giving form and giving shape to the earth. Number one, not only is it without form, it's also what? Void. So verses 20 and following, it's going to be God who creates creatures to populate the earth. So we already have a, 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 an outline of Genesis chapter 1. God's going to bring form and shape to the earth, and he's also going to populate the earth. So days 1 through 4, the first four days, involve the issue of bringing form to the earth. Days 5 and 6 address the issue of that void nature. God's going to now create some creatures to inhabit the earth. Okay? With that, uh, notice verse 19. And the evening and the morning were the fourth day. Okay? Now, 
So verse 20, what day are we now in? No, no, wait, wait, wait. Verse 19, and the evening and the morning were the what? So now day number four is over with. So verse 20 is what day? Five. Yes, five comes after four. Verse 20, and God said, let the waters bring forth abundantly the moving creature that hath life and fowl that may fly above the earth in the open firmament of heaven and god created great whales and every living creature that moveth from the waters brought forth abundantly after their kind and every winged fowl after his kind and god saw that it was what okay so that's what day was all of these creatures created day five what does god then create on day six that's when god creates who verse 26 and god said let us make man in our image so Adam is created on what day? Day number six. So, uh, day number five, God creates the sea creatures, he creates the land animals, and he creates the uh, flying animals, all right? You have the sea, air, land. And hence, you know, you have ocean, marine biology, oceanography, so forth. You have meteorology, aerodynamics, and then, of course, you have uh, biology and physics and so forth, you know, the land creatures, okay? So, now, on the sixth day, God creates Adam. So what does God do now on the sixth day? Chapter 2. And notice there in verse 19. Uh, chapter 2, verse 19. And out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every fowl of the air and brought, him, uh, brought them unto him, uh, unto Adam, to see what he would call them. And whatsoever Adam called every living creature, that was the name Thereof, And Adam gave names to all cattle and to the fowl of the earth and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found and help meet for him. When were these creatures created in Genesis chapter 1? What day? Now, here in verse 19, we read, And out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field. But according to Genesis 1, where did these creatures come from? Came from the waters. But that was day five. Chapter 2, verse 19 and 20, specifically, isn't a, an account of day five. On day five, God created, the birds came from the water uh, on day five. But now Adam is already there in the garden, so it has to be day six or thereafter. God now creates in the sight of Adam. There is creation in day, on day five, but there is now God's creative work on day six or after. You see, that's why there's a difference between chapter 2, verse 19, and chapter 1, verse 20 and 21. There is no contradiction if we understand we got to rightly divide the days in which God did create creatures on day five, but there is a special work of creation on day six. Adam gets to see God doing the creative work. Because where was Adam on day five? Adam didn't even exist. All of a sudden, Adam is created and there's creatures all over. And you wonder, Adam's probably thinking, I wonder where all these creatures came from. So God says, hold on a second. And boom, he creates in front of that. And Adam now realizes you are the one who created all of this stuff. And then, of course, God says, I'm, I want you to name all of these animals, okay? I asked the question last time. When God said in Genesis chapter 1, verse uh, 26, go to Genesis 126, And God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. Adam, you're going to be a king of the ants. You're going to be a king of, uh, of, of the spiders. And you think, yeah, wait a minute. Uh, what, what, remember, we're not going to go there. Psalms chapter 18. God crowned Adam with glory and what? Honor. Adam, you're going to rule over all of this. And Adam's thinking, well, you know, man, you've got the cattle. They've got to be cleaned up. And you've got the spiders. And, the, and, you know, Eve doesn't really care for all these little bugs, you know. And you think, was, was Adam being punished? The replication principle. 
when we, and this is what we're going to do right now, the things that God materially, physically, visibly created in the sight of Adam, and God says, Adam, you're going to be a king and a ruler and a magistrate over all of this. I have given you a crown of honor and glory. But we have to understand the visible can say some things about the what? The invisible. Now, wait a minute. If we apply that replication principle to what God intended Adam to rule over, we find out that the uh, the visible has a correlation to the invisible. Adam wasn't sentenced to be a king over the ants. But there are some creatures in the invisible realm that Adam was created to exercise some governmental rule and authority over. And what God was doing in the garden, he's slowly communicating this information to Adam. He's teaching him. He's instructing him. He's educating him. But what happened to the education? It came to a screeching halt because one of the creatures called a what? Uh, Well, a serpent. Uh, chapter 3, verse 1. Now the serpent. Oh, wait a minute. A serpent. Remember the replication principle? Is there a material, visible, physical creature that we understand to be a what? But if we understand the replication principle, what does this visible creature represent? An invisible creature. You see, Adam... You're supposed to be the king over the serpents. And you think, I don't want to be a king over cobras and king snakes and garter snakes. Oh, wait a minute. There's more to the physical. You see, those snakes serve as examples and shadows and types and replicas of there's something else in the universe. Now, isn't it interesting? Uh, Jesus Christ is called the Lamb of God, right? Right? And obviously, there is a material, visible creature called the lamb. But doesn't that lamb serve as a shadow and a type of an invisible, of Jesus Christ, who was a lamb? You see the, the correlation? So when you, when you read Genesis 1, uh, it's easy to just assume, ah, he's just, you know, I mean, I'd rather be in charge of the galaxy than to be char- in charge of creeping things. Wait a minute. There's something going on in the creation. So. Let's now look at all of these different replicas. We're in Genesis chapter um, uh, 2, right? And uh, notice there in Genesis chapter 2, and uh, let's start reading at verse 8. Look at verse 8. And the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden. A garden. So, 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 now, by the way, Eden is a territory. I, I'm not saying it's a city. I, who knows what it is, okay? But, but there's an area, there is a landmass. And for those of you that have, were with us with the, with the Revelation class, remember, here's modern-day Turkey, real quick. Here's Egypt, right? Uh, Egypt's over here. You have uh, Arabia over there, uh, the Gulf and all so forth. And um, you have, this is Israel, Correct. And you have the river Euphrates that starts out there in the Turkish area and it, and it flows on down into the Persian uh, Gulf area. Eden is in this particular area. So you have a, a, a territory called Eden. But what did God do in the eastern part of Eden? He, he, he pl- By the way, did he create or what did he do? He, now isn't that interesting terminology? Uh, you know, Rochelle, and I commend people that work that, but when you guys planted, what does it mean to plant? You just got to dig up the soil, and you got you to gotta work it, and you got to treat it, and then you, you put the seeds down there, and you so forth. Isn't it interesting that when God describes what he did there in this territory called Eden, he says that he planted a garden. Now, my own personal opinion is it's at the very edge of the Euphrates River. Now, I understand this is all different, but... Uh, in the easternmost region of Eden, he plants a garden. Where does the concept of a garden come from? Uh, let's, let's look at what we find uh, here in this particular garden. 
verse 9. And out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every what? So wait a minute. There's a garden, and then there's a, and then what kind of a, of a, of a cre- creation? A tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life also in the midst of the garden. And the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And verse 10, and a river went out of Eden to water the what? The garden. And, and then look at verse 11. You have the names of these rivers. Uh, ver, verse 11, the name of the first is, is Pison. Uh, that is it which compasses the whole land of Havilah, where there is gold. Verse 12, and the gold of that land is good. There is Bedlam and the onyx stone. So, so think of uh, verse 15. And the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to dress it and to heap it. To keep, you protect it. You defend it. There's something wrong going, okay? So right off the bat, we have a garden. We have rivers. And by the way, remember the whole issue of the appearance of age. Adam was created as a man who immediately communicated with the Lord. Uh, There is in the garden trees. And there are rivers. And there are minerals. Gold. And by the way, just for sake of time, there are stones. A river, according to geologists, will tell you it takes hundreds, if not thousands of years. A river, if you have a trickle of water from a higher elevation to a lower elevation, and it takes years and years and years, and pretty soon that little trickle becomes a little brook, it becomes a little creek, it becomes a stream, and it becomes a Mississippi. You know, when God created this garden, it already had rivers. So when a geologist says, oh, that took about 10,000 years to make, I understand something about how God created. God created with clear appearance of age. Adam's an adult. By the way, there's trees. And, and what are on these trees? Fruit. How long does it take for a piece? Of, so if God created the seed, and then you've got to wait until the tree grows, and then you've got to wait until the fruit pre- When God planted it all, the tree was a mature tree because it's already producing fruit. So you understand when science tries to study the physical universe, the natural science, they, they, they apply the law of uniformity, okay? Danger. You, you can't use what, what is today does not mean it was what it was in the past. What was in the past does not mean and not, nothing decays at the same rate, so on and so forth. God created everything with the appearance of age. So that helps us understand. Well, wait a minute. Where does the concept of a garden where, did the, where does the concept of a tree, where does the concept of fruit, where does the concept of rivers, where does, it all, where does the concept of gold come from? Replication principle. Go to 2 Corinthians chapter 12. 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Have you ever wondered why? <clears throat> 2 Corinthians chapter 12. 2 Corinthians 12 verse 4. This is Paul, all right? We're breaking right into the context. We better read verse 2, okay? Uh, Verse 2 of 2 Corinthians chapter 12. I knew a man in Christ above 14 years ago, whether in the body I cannot tell, or whether out of the body I cannot tell, God knoweth. Such an one caught up to the third heaven. There is the first heaven called the open heaven. Then there's this closed heaven, the second heaven. But then there's the third heaven, and that's where God dwells. Verse 3, and I knew such a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I cannot tell God knoweth. Now look at verse 4, how that he was caught up into what? Paradise. There is an area, go to Revelation chapter 2, Revelation chapter 2. God is replicating on the material planet earth what already exists in the third heaven. In the the heaven, it's called paradise. Paradise. In Revelation chapter 2, verse uh, 7, Revelation 2, verse 7. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the tree of life. Now, in Genesis chapter 2, God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and he put there a tree, and uh, 
One is called the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, but there's another tree there called what? But where is this tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of who? I know something about paradise. Paradise, according to Paul, is where? And in paradise, you have a tree. You know, paradise is a garden. God has a garden. It's in the third heaven. And he's got a tree there. And so what? that is what exists there. And so God creates Adam. And he plants a garden. And in the garden, he plants trees. A tree of life. I'll go to chapter 22. Revelation chapter 22. Revelation chapter 22. Can you imagine the heartbreak as the Lord Jesus, and, and I do believe that's the Lord Jesus but there in the garden. And remember, he said, where are you? Adam, where, Adam, where are you? I mean, I'm, I'm, you know what the Lord's trying to tell Adam? Adam, guess what? You're going to have dominion over this paradise. It's going to supplant what's here. And Adam, you're going to have dominion. You're going to have rule over all of this. And Adam forfeited it for a piece of fruit. Revelation chapter 22. You see, short-term gain and pleasure, right? Sacrificing eternity. You see, Hebrews says that sin is pleasurable for what? Just for that quick fix. Just to satisfy that quick high. That instantaneous enjoyment. But you sacrifice all of eternity. You know what Adam did? He sacrificed eternity for short-term temporal satisfaction. Man, you've you got to believe Je the Lord. And now that eternal plan where the, the Lord says, I now got to become one of you. you see that, Adam? You're the first one. Well, I'm going to be the last one. You're the first man. I'm going to have to be the second one now, Adam. But that's okay. God and his wisdom already risked. He risked Adam disobeying. You see, there has to be free will. The Bible demands free will. The Lord's trying to tell Adam what's going to happen. Revelation chapter 22, verse 1. And he showed me a pure river of life. Now, wait a minute. Isn't there a river in the Garden of Eden? Clear as crystal proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. And in the midst of the street. Wait, there's a street up there? And, and what is that street made out of? Out of what? Now, what, what, where was gold in Genesis? In the garden, right? What do you think God intended to do with the gold? If there's a street made out of, I have a feeling I know what God's doing with that gold. And by the way, all of those stones in the garden, Bethlehem, the, the onyx stone, the, 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 the fires of stone, the diamond, the barrel, all of that. What do you think God was going to do with all of that on the planet? Listen. The reality of it is already there. Verse 2, in the midst of the street of it and on either side of the river was there the tree of life which bare 12 manner of what? Fruits, just like the Garden of Eden. You, you see the replication principle? We don't, when we study science, Bible science, biblical science, we understand what God is doing in the natural world is a replica of the invisible world and, and, and what he ultimately intended to do. Um, Go to Ezekiel chapter 1. Ezekiel chapter 1. Now, we're going to go quickly for the remaining 10 minutes, but Ezekiel chapter 1. On day 5, okay, let's see if you guys are paying attention. On day 5 of creation, what did God create? He, he created what? He created all of those animal creatures, right? The creatures. So, if there are visible material creatures, Beasts of the what? The field. And then what's in the air? Fowl. And then Genesis specifically says, what kind of apparatus does the fowl have to have? Wings. 
Is there a counterpart in the heaven? Are there beasts in heaven? And are there creatures that have wings? Now, do you understand what God is seeking to, to tell Adam? Uh, Ezekiel chapter 1, right? Look there at verse 10. Ezekiel chapter 1, verse 10. As for the likeness of their faces, and by the way, you have these seraphim. Um, uh, for, as, uh, as for the likeness of their faces, they four had the face of a man and the face of a lion and, on the right side. And they four had the face of an ox on the left side. They four also had the face of a what? Now, this is Ezekiel who is literally transported into the invisible realm. And he now is describing the various creatures. There's seraphim, cherubim, angels, so on and so forth. But when Ezekiel sees these creatures, isn't he very specific? He doesn't say, look at verse uh, uh, 10. As for the likeness of their faces, they four had the face of, well, it looked like a man, and the face of, you know, the closest thing that I can, re- I'm going to say it's like a li- What did Ezekiel see? Hey, there's a lion up there. There's a face of a lion, and there's a face of a what? An ox. So the natural world possesses beasts that replicate something that's already out there in the heavenly places. Um, Go to Isaiah chapter 6. Isaiah chapter 6. So the idea of beasts, make no mistake, Ezekiel isn't saying, you know, the closest thing that I can kind of liken it to, no, he's very specific. That's a lion, that's an eagle, and that's an ox. Isaiah chapter 6, Isaiah chapter 6, verse 1. In the year that King uh, Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. Above it stood the seraphims. Each one had six what? So now, so Adam, Adam, you're going to be king of the, the fowl. You know, the eagles and the hawks and the sparrows and so forth. But what do you think God is ultimately going to communicate to Adam? You know, just as you see creatures in the visible realm that have wings, in the invisible realm, there are creatures that have what? Wings. You see, the Lord didn't have an opportunity to get that far with the school program. Sin put a, a, a screeching halt. But you see, God did create a representation of what is already out there. Verse 2, above it stood the seraphims. Each one had six wings, which with twain he covered his face, and with twain he covered his feet, and with twain he did what? So there are creatures that fly out there. So don't be shocked if in the invisible realm there are creatures with wings that can transfer. Now, if you look at, I think, what is the, the fastest fowl? Is it the peregrine falcon? It can hit like 100 miles an hour. 200 miles an hour? Man, those, those are nasty birds. <laughs> uh, a peregrine falcon, I, if I remember, is, is one of the fastest uh, air uh, creature. And, now, this is in a dive, okay? So this thing can dive 200, uh, I thought it was 100-something miles an hour. How fast do you think a seraphim can fly? <laughs> six wings? If a falcon has two wings, can you imagine multiply by six? Uh, these things... Can fly. Go to chapter 60, Isaiah chapter 60. Isaiah chapter 60. And uh, oh, there's one, there's one thing that we really got to look at. Isaiah chapter 60 and verse 8. 60 verse 8. 60 verse 8. Who are these that fly as a cloud and as the doves to their windows huh go to ezekiel okay i want to go really really quickly go to ezekiel again chapter 10 go to ezekiel chapter 10 uh ezekiel chapter 10 um remember what kind of creature was lucifer he was a a, he was an anointed cherub right how many wings does a cherub have four wings how many wings does a seraphim have it's very specific okay um 
So if you can envision, once again, we're not going to go to Ezekiel 28, but you have Lucifer out there. And Lucifer, as an anointed cherub, had four wings, and he wore uh, a covering of stones. Okay, And Lucifer means light bearer. So if you can just envision a, a creature that has four wings that, that uh, puts on a robe of stone, and he is light. Uh, he's not light like the Lord, but he manifests light. And in this creature, as he reflects the light through these different colored stones, you're going to have this, this kaleidoscope effect. You're going to have this rainbow effect of light. But at the same time, there's something about those wings. When we were in Revelation, we, we, we mentioned that in Ezekiel chapter uh, 10, verse 5, and the sound of the cherubim's wings was heard even to the outer court as the voice of the almighty God when he, what? Speaketh. Now, it's interesting in Ezekiel 28 that God says, hey, Lucifer, you were in Eden. But that's not Genesis 1 Eden. You were on the mountain of God and every stone was thy covering. You know that that Lucifer, as the reflection of light, and as those stones were his covering, and he had four wings, and guess what Lucifer was doing in the universe? When he would flap and spread the wings, he was the voice of Almighty God. Lucifer had the highest place of governmental rule in all of creation. No one. He was the sum of beauty. He was the sum of all wisdom. You know who's next above him? It's the Godhead. So here, now think about Adam. Lucifer, you're in charge of it all. All of those stones are yours. And when you speak, you speak as my voice. Guess what Adam was created to do? Adam, you're in charge of it all. And Adam, when you speak, who is he speaking for? The voice of Almighty God. Adam's sin died. The second Adam. Who's the second Adam? And what is his name? The Word. You see, Jesus Christ, who is the perfect Adam, the second Adam, he does and can do. Guess what the first Adam should have done? You see, if if God says, Adam, you're going to exercise dominion, it isn't his own. He speaks on the behalf of Almighty God. It's pretty powerful. Little side note. When you and I preach the gospel, whose voice are we? It's the voice of God, right? So when they shoot you, it's okay. You see, you know, don't, don't shoot the messenger kind of a thing. You understand, we're members of the church, the body of Christ. You know that right now on planet Earth, where is, outside of the word of God, where is the, quote, audible voice of God? Listen, it's when we're preaching this book. And now you understand why Lucifer hates us with, with such deep ire and hatred. We're doing what he once did. And not only that, we're taking over a realm that he, well, currently exercises authority. Aren't you and I light? Yeah, Ephesians chapter 5, we don't reflect. Ye are light where? Everything that Lucifer was, he was light. He had the voice of authority. He had government rule. God says in the second Adam, I'm going to do it with a new creature called the church, the body of Christ. Isn't that wonderful? We're going to be doing some things that used to be his realm. Of, I mean, just, just wild stuff. Um, Okay, also on day five, God created whales. Adam, you're a king of the whale. What are you going to do with a whale? I mean, first of all, I mean, the whale is in what? In water, right? What's Adam going to do? You know, I have a right now to ride the thing. or I mean, what's going on? Adam, you will now be king of the whales. In the visible realm, we know something about a whale. And we know that whales dwell in what? In the seas. Isn't that a shadow of the... Is there in the invisible realm a creature called a whale? 
Remember what God said to Pharaoh of Egypt? Not, not the Pharaoh where Israel was delivered, but later on uh, they engaged in combat with Babylon. God, he's talking to Pharaoh, and he says to Pharaoh, you are a whale. Now, what an insult is that? You know, Jeff, you know, you're a whale. Now, if you wait, you know, <laughs> don't get me wrong. I mean, boy, if that's the best insult you could hurl at me, I'm a whale. But wait a minute, in Scripture, who is described as a sea creature? Satan is a whale. So when God created the visible, material, physical whale, it is a shadow of a creature that is also called a whale in the invisible realm. He's also called a serpent. And he's occupying the seas out there. Um, remember in Genesis 9? Go, go One more verse. We've we got to get going. Go to uh, uh, Ezekiel. We're still in Ezekiel, right? Go to chapter 1. Go back to chapter 1. Remember when God wiped out all of the human race except for eight people on the ark, right? And then God says, I- I'm not going to destroy man anymore with a flood. And here is the covenant. Here is my promise to humanity that I won't destroy humanity with a flood. What's he going to destroy with humanity with instead? What would you rather do, drown or be burned to death? I think I'd rather drown. I don't know. Well, anyway, so God says... I'm going to seal my promise. How did God seal the covenant that he won't destroy humanity with a flood anymore? Where, does the, where did that come from? Ezekiel chapter 1, verse 27. Ezekiel 127. And I saw as the color of amber, as the appearance of fire round about within it, from the appearance of his loins even upward, and from the appearance of his loins even downward. I saw as it were the appearance of fire, and it had brightness round about it. You know what Ezekiel's describing? There's the throne of Almighty God. Verse 28, as the appearance of the bow that is in the cloud in the day of rain, so was the appearance of the brightness round about. Ezekiel literally sees the throne room of Almighty God, and, how do, and he describes a rainbow like in the day of rain. What, what did Noah see in Genesis chapter 9? He saw a rainbow. That rainbow is a replica of a rainbow that surrounds the throne room of Almighty God. God created visible waters. You know what? There is waters in the third heaven. Brimstone. How did God destroy brimstone? What did I just say? <laughs> How did God destroy Sodom and Gomorrah? Just gave it. Brimstone. Where, does brimstone. where did the brimstone come from? It came from heaven. God opened up the windows of heaven, and guess what fell down? Brimstone. Brimstone comes from heaven. Remember when God fed Israel with what? Manna? It's called angels' food. Angels' food? Angels have to eat? Well, according to Psalm 78, yeah. They eat something called angels. It's called manna. Where did the manna come from? It came from heaven. It's food. Uh, we could go on and the, here's something and we're going to stop the tabernacle when God told Moses, you know, not only are you supposed to have all of the furnishings and all of the uh, appliances and apparatus, you know, that when the Lord says, and, and now you're going to use special spices for perfumes, the apothe- uh, apothecary and all that in heaven, you know, that there is incense. How do you make incense? Don't you need these spices? So when Moses was instructed to, to cre- build the tabernacle, which is the example and pattern of the true tabernacle, the Lord actually gives Moses the recipe to make the incense. And in Revelation, when John sees the throne room in the third heaven, he sees the prayers of the saints likened as to what? Incense. And it's a sweet smell unto Almighty God. We're going to stop. It, the creation, the, the material universe is patterned after its counterpart in the invisible realm. And that's, that's, an, that's a fascinating aspect when studying the creation 
Father, we do thank you for your grace. We thank you for your wisdom. We thank you for your word. And we thank you, Father, that uh, one day you will establish the eternal righteous rule of your worthy son, the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you, Lord, that our part is eternally there in the heavenly places. We, we thank you that we can uh, study uh, the natural sciences from the perspective uh, of your word that we can see things through your eyes. We can study and, and, ex and analyze and observe uh, the natural world through the frame of reference that you give, and that is your word. We thank you, Lord, for uh, your purpose and uh, how it is we uh, are going to be a part of it. We thank you, of course, in Christ Jesus' name. Amen.